Thanks for the introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, please note that I'm an academic and sufficiently confused and, and so on that feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, better to ask them than to not. So it won't uh, interrupt my flow of thought at all. So what this is uh, an attempt to fairly quickly just cover some of the dimensions of the, the rural poor in Bangladesh. We are interested in their water supply systems and clearly as we'll see and perhaps some of you already have got a pretty good awareness of, of the degree of problems but they are substantial. However, before I should suggest that I'm the guy that does all the hard work, there's actually a whole bunch of people that are involved. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge really from the outset uh, graduate students, particularly Ryan Brennan, he spent four months there. Heather Murphy who spent a lot of time there, Laura Roberts and Kim Thomas. They worked in Cambodia on a similar kind of a issue. They were, it was related to arsenic but it was also waterborne pathogens. So these people are instrumental in the, uh, in the work that I'm describing right now. <coughs> I also was very fortunate, I have very good contacts in Bangladesh and they've been incredibly useful in terms of uh, providing you know, the NGO contacts that we could actually use to get people on board and the laboratory analysis and so on. So lots of help that's very important. However, <coughs> no big surprise on this one, but water is the basis of life. We cannot live without it. And more than a billion people do not have access to, to safe drinking water and 2.6 billion people lack access to basic sanitation. Clearly a problem far beyond Bangladesh itself, but certainly present in Bangladesh. It's the most densely populated country in the world, 160 million people. More than 1.8 million people die each year from diarrheal diseases, of which 90% are children under five living mostly in developing countries. So. Bangladesh in, we'll just say 1960, doesn't really matter which year, clearly had a huge problem of bacterial contamination and, well, waterborne pathogens. <coughs> and this would be an example of a village, one of the villages that I was visiting. Here is the one toilet that was actually in the village. So about 1,500 people typically. They only have two cities really in Bangladesh plus 80,000 villages. So. About 1,000, 1,500 people live in this village. This is the individual who is the regional councillor. However, really when you think about a latrine, which is what this thing is at the back, it's not really, it's simply a private enclosure. So, you know, not surprisingly, huge issues in terms of waterborne pathogens in that uh, water. <coughs> Other examples would be uh, cow washing, uh, kids are playing, etc. So for reasons that a lot of countries encountered, um, access to clean water was a huge issue. Huge bacterial contamination. <coughs> so as a result of the, sub, of the surface water microbial pollution, they were looking for an alternative. And at about the 1970s when there was rural electrification, in other words electricity became available beyond the major cities, and the development of the tube well, which is a relatively inexpensive way of getting water out of the shallow groundwater, and also pumps that would run on gasoline. What this allowed then was access to groundwater to, you know, forego having to use this surface water. Huge opportunity. <coughs> so as a result, there was a huge transformation to use groundwater as a water supply source to avoid the microbial pollution. They built then 10 million tube wells. Not just a couple thousand or whatever, but 10 million. So in the village that you saw the picture of just a few minutes ago, there are about five in that village. And it, you know, it, it was a, a, a real opportunity, everyone thought. <coughs> but unfortunately, the groundwater, they discovered after the fact, has arsenic contamination. There's all sorts of reasons why, but and we'll see it a little bit without getting too technical, but arsenic has different um, characteristics depending upon the, the groundwater characteristics. In other words, when it turns anaerobic or the absence of oxygen, it is then mobilized. And if you can get it aerated, then it will deposit. And we'll see that principle in some of the pictures of the treatment technologies that we're looking at. <coughs> But as you put on then a lot of farmers' fields and you irrigate, you create then anaerobic conditions in the groundwater if it wasn't already present. Then also when you put fertilizers on, phosphorus will compete 
for the sedimentation opportunity. Really what happens, and without getting too complicated, iron, if it changes redox state or characteristic state, will precipitate out. And what happens is it's not really a one-on-one, -on -one, it's a sorption, co-sorption effect so that the arsenic is, is settling out with the iron. So there are certain sorption sites that the arsenic likes to find on those iron particles as they are settling. The problem is phosphorus competes with the iron, uh, with the arsenic. So if you've got lots of fertilizer, i.e. lots of phosphorus, you get competition. So we really have a, a really challenging issue because <coughs> while the iron is high, there is a lot of anaerobic condition, a lot of mobilization of the arsenic, and then when the arsenic, uh, sorry, when the iron does precipitate out, it doesn't remove the arsenic, it removes the phosphorus instead. <coughs> so, just in terms of history, the shift to the groundwater, to use of the groundwater in 1970s, and now 97% coverage in the rural areas, so very, very widespread. 10 million wells installed before arsenic was discovered in 1993. Naturally in the groundwater, these are not human caused, these are uh, erosion from the Himalayas, etc., forming in the deltaic plain. In other words, if you think of Bangladesh here, the Ganges comes down from India, the Brahmaputra comes around from China, so on. Primarily it's the Ganges, but nonetheless for, you know, eons, a lot of soil movement with natural arsenic deposits. So it's not anthropogenic, or people didn't cause the arsenic problem in terms of it being in the sediments. <coughs> so it's naturally in the groundwater, greater than 50 micrograms per liter in 25 to 40 percent of shallow tube wells six in 61 of 64 districts in Bangladesh. So this is not a problem of, you know, this particular location. This is a countrywide problem. This particular number we'll see kind of periodically, but that's the, the World Health Organization standard. That's the standard that you'd like to be below. Now that even will be seen to be a problem because that's not low enough, but it's the best you can get with reasonable expenditure of money. So just keep track of this, and I'm not going to make a big deal of it, but this is the WHO standard of 50 micrograms per liter. Huge amounts of the area then encompassed within or exceeding that level. <clears throat> the result is 21 to 40 million people are exposed and 40,000 people have arsenicosis. So we know arsenic causes cancer. So just some more examples of it, but 90% of the tube wells in Samta, which is one of the districts, Bangladesh, have water exceeding Bangladesh standard of 0 0.05. Now I've switched to milligrams per liter. I apologize for that, but anyway, that's that same number. So 90% of the tube wells in a particular district are in excess of that standard. This is not a localized individual problem. This is very widespread. More than 50% of the tube wells in Kandel province in Cambodia have water exceeding the arsenic standard. So this is not a problem unique to Cambodia or, or Bangladesh. It's a problem, as suggested here, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Argentina, Eastern Canada. Um, all sorts of places have the problem. Of course, it depends on how much money do you have to renovate the water to get lesser levels of concentrations. <coughs> so very widespread, it's, it is an element, so it doesn't get destroyed by something, it simply changes its state and it is still resident there. That will be an issue too. <coughs> the health effects, uh, many cancers formed, uh, skin, lung, bladder, kidney, and so on, so these are two examples of evidence you know, of in individuals. There is no known medicine to get rid of the problem although drinking arsenic-free water for a period of time will reduce the amount in the body and so in some symptom relief if provided at an early stage. So you can avoid it if you can get rid of it, but clearly lots of people with the problem. And as you can imagine, not, not a great deal of wealth uh, that can afford very much. <coughs> so what can we do to mitigate this problem? Well, we might use a nearby con uncontaminated well. But the problem, of course, is the contamination is very widespread. You can't simply say, oh, well, we'll just relocate and get the water from somewhere else because perhaps that well isn't contaminated right now, but it may become so in the future. And even aside from that, there's an awful lot of contaminated wells. Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah I was going to say, the depth would also be <coughs> 
contaminant, uh, similar contamination then? Yeah, it's very hard to tell actually. Um, they, these things go up to about 80 feet, uh, 30 meters or so, mm -hmm. 25 meters in terms of depth. Um, if you're in Dhaka, Dhaka being like 12 million people, huge city, and they know about the arsenic problem, what they did is they have very long wells, so they take the water from the very deep horizons, and the water's good there. The, the issue is in the shallow horizons of the soil. So big places like Dhaka, they can avoid the problem. Little places, that's just too expensive, both to drill well, but also to uh, pump the water up. So you could, as I just suggested, drill into the deep aquifer, and that's what the big cities have done. Um, then you get into a subsidence problem, which is another issue completely, but when you draw water out of very deep horizons, the soil tent, the part of the pressure of the weight of the overlying soil is taken by the water. As soon as you remove the soil, now the pressure squashes things down. So they have a huge problem of subsidence in DACA. But anyway, so drilled into the deep aquifer is a possibility if you have enough money. We could remove the arsenic from the groundwater and clearly that's one of the things we're trying to do as we'll see. You might capture rainwater. You know, so they, and, and again we'll show this in a, few, in a number of slides from now, but the rainwater is, is clearly there's some uh, bird feces and so on in, on the roofs, so it's not pristine, but it's not arsenic contaminated. But of course, you, they have really a dry season and a wet season. So you can capture the rain during the wet season, and if you have a big enough cistern, you can retain the water for a long enough period that perhaps one or two or maybe even three months. But it gets pretty skunky water after it's been there for quite a while. So. We'll come back and talk about this as an option to alleviate some of the problem. And the other possibility, which is, again, there'll be a slide or two on this, but to treat the surface water. In other words, go back to the surface water, treat it, there's not the arsenic issue, now it's a fecal or well, a waterborne pathogen problem. The problem with this one is people look at the groundwater and say, this is clean, that's dirty, I know what I want to drink, because it's not a known. They, they don't like the appearance of it. Arsenic doesn't look like it, it's a problem because you can't see it. Anyway, we'll see some slides on it. So here's arsenic. It's a met metalloid with a number of oxidation states. Three, zero, three, and five. Well, actually, there's a minus sign missing from this one, but it's just over there on the right. That influences very much the mobility of the arsenic. So if we can change the redox characteristic or these, these valences here, we can change the mobility of it. It is a known carcinogen. Some of them, like arsenic with a zero, uh, should be valence, huh? anyway, uh, does not have adverse effects on the body. It passes straight through. Sorry? Yeah? I had a question whether it's drinking water or it's water used for hygiene or what's the... Well, the most important thing is when you drink it yeah. because then it's, it's internal to the body. Yeah, that's not really a, a big issue because we're, as long as we're down to reasonable low levels, I don't mean to be better than the WHO standard, uh, then it's probably okay. It is the consumption of it so and the food too. But and, food and I'm sorry, the and washing food as well. e, uh, yes, although actually, I don't know how far to go on all of this because you can spend a long time on it, but. One of the problems is when you remove the arsenic from the water, this now drains back into the system and then the foodborne. So in other words, when the, you know, the tuber or whatever is growing, it uptakes arsenic as well. So actually they're getting about 10% of their arsenic from food, 90% from water, typically. Okay, uh, you're asking a question I'm not 100% sure on, but basically the surface water is not arsenic contaminated. Okay. It, you know, there are circumstances where it could be, but most of the time, no. So that would be fine. It would be the, the waterborne pathogens that I would worry about. Now, if they were, well, anyway, I think that's pretty pretty reasonable answer in terms of it's not really a, a huge issue as far as the arsenic is concerned. There will be some bioaccumulation, but not, not a huge amount because it's not high in the uh, um, 
in the surface water. Um, the other thing which is intriguing is all people are impacted more or less equally. In other words, the young, pregnant, female, old, and so on, it doesn't matter a whole lot. It will matter in terms of body weight. But there's not, you know, it's not like waterborne pathogens where the people that get impacted the most are the very young and the very old. This impacts everybody. So let's just look for a second at the typical uh, characteristic of risk assessment because it does show us something quite important. Here's the daily intake. This is the amount of water consumed times the concentration. So again, I apologize, I'm switching units a little bit, but otherwise you get into a lot of zeros. 0 0.03 micrograms per liter. That's really, really low. We'll see why in a minute. But if we get that standard, that's actually the standard we have in Canada for arsenic. So if you remember what I said earlier about, um, you know, we have a desirable 50 milligrams per liter, but now this one is 0 0.03, so 1,600 times lower. People drink about two liters per, per day. If you then say, okay, I'm drinking this kind of concentration at two liters per day, I'm consuming then about 0 0.6, 0 0.06, uh, should say micrograms per day over here. That's the consumptive use, but also for drinking, cooling, and personal hygiene and so on, you use 20 liters per day. That'll be important later too, but let's just, without dwelling on the huge detail, just remember that this is the standard, for example, that we apply in Nova Scotia, where they do have arsenic. This is the lifetime average daily dose. So in other words, here's that 0 0.06 micrograms per liter per day times 365 days per year, number of days in a year. We take 70 years as a lifetime expectancy. It's a reasonable number. We divide then by 70 kilograms. This is the body weight. So if you're a bigger person, you can consume more and it won't cause you as much harm as you're a little person. Uh, this is a, just a unit change. And then this is the number of years which we are exposed to it. So in other words, if you're going to live in an area and etc., what that ends up is, is 8.57 to 10 to the minus 7 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, again, we don't need to worry about it per se, but this is the how much you consume by living there, drinking the water at 0 0.03 micrograms per liter. The cancer slow factor for arsenic is 1.5. And again, the units aren't matter. But let's just look at the next page. This is then the risk. So in other words, I take the 1.5, which was the cancer slow factor, and I've got this thing, which is what I'm consuming by drinking water. I get an exposure concentration of 1.3 times 10 to the minus six. So that's 1.3 in a million is the probability that you're gonna get cancer from drinking arsenic at 0 0.03 micrograms per liter. <clears throat> okay? In risk assessment jargon, what that really means is if you ride a bicycle for 10 miles or you take an airplane trip for 1,000 miles, I'm sorry about the units, but anyway, 1,600 kilometers, I guess, or you eat peanut butter every morning or you uh, have char broiled a little bit too much, the steaks, or you drink wine with a little bit of benzene and etc., one in a million is considered de minimis risk you accept it as a member of society, you cannot have a risk-free environment. So if you consume the peanut butter or the charcoal steaks or the beer which has uh, NDMA in it or whatever, one in a million. So in other words, <coughs> that's where the 0 .03 came from. We work backwards to know, knowing the cancer potential, what is the concentration which will get you de minimis risk or 1.3 times 10 to the minus six. So the exposure risk to the individual consuming water at this concentration for 70 years is de minimis between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6. That's how we do risk assessment problems. Well, the problem is, of course, we don't have 0 0.03. We have 50 micrograms per liter. So what happened is the World Health Organization lowered the guidance guideline value for arsenic in drinking water from 0 0.05 milligrams per liter to 0 0.01 milligrams per liter in 1993. However, places like Cambodia, Bangladesh and others, they cannot afford to get to that level. So they continue to operate at this level. They would love to be at 0 0.03 micrograms per liter, or in other words, 0 0.00003 
a whole lot lower. Now there is the risk when you consume water at this concentration is about 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3. So in other words, it's 1,640 times as large as adopted in developing countries. So do we like the, the number? No. But can we do anything about it? No. So what we're trying to do is to get to this concentration. And I just start out with this just to demonstrate that it's not what we would like to have, but it's what we can manage to obtain without huge amounts of effort. So now we're into Bangladesh. And this is an example of a treatment technology. You can see there's two vessels here. And this is where the water comes in, and then it moves over here and, and so on. And I'll explain a little bit more why later. But here's where the water actually comes in here to this first vessel, which is on the, on the right up here. And if you see, what it is is a trough with a bunch of holes in it. And what it does is it aerates the water as you fall from this point down to a lower point. And what you're doing is introducing oxygen you change what is called the redox characteristic. In other words, move it from the, the three to the five, which then allows it to precipitate out. Now it doesn't precipitate out immediately, it takes some time. So actually what these things involve is aeration, residency time to let it kind of, let the iron be removed. The iron takes out the arsenic with it by co-sorption, and then you filter it in an upward flow system. So this little guy here is actually flowing upward. And the idea then is the, the suspended material, which is now kind of like a flocculent, fluffy sort of stuff, it is retained then within a filter system in here so that the water has moved through a rock or a filter bed. It moves through up here and now discharges out. So you look for a residency time of about a day maybe two days if you can manage it. So this would be an example of a small system. The whole idea is household level or maybe two or three households, but not a very big system. We'll see a bigger system in a second. The whole feature though is, look, there's no energy involved here. So it's very nice because they don't have a lot of money for electricity, etc. All you have to do is get the water into this thing. Physical change happens then, you aerate it. That makes the irons precipitate out, and as long as there's not a lot of phosphorus, you will remove the arsenic along with the arsenic. Uh, yeah, you remove the arsenic along with the iron. What's the most important thing it's dependent on, though? You got to have iron. <coughs> in Bangladesh, the iron in groundwater is typically about 11 milligrams per liter. In Cambodia, it's about half that. It doesn't work very well in Cambodia, in other words. And here we are fighting away trying to get rid of iron when really what we want to get rid of is arsenic, but the reason we want to get rid of iron is because it will take the arsenic out with it. So what would work in Cambodia, uh, sorry, in, our, in Bangladesh does not work very well in uh, Cambodia. So a little bit different, but that's okay. We can handle it different ways. It's just no one size fits all. This is an example of what the water looks like when it's been aerated. So now the iron's coming out of solution and trying to deposit, and then we, as I say, filter it through something rather modest to try to then remove the material. And then occasionally, about once a month, what you do is you backwash, you send water the other way to wash all of the sediments that have come out within that filter. You wash them out and put them somewhere. That's an issue, but the idea then at least is you've removed the arsenic from the water that's being consumed. Okay, so that's how it's supposed to work. The problem is, of course, they don't have much to do with the backwash water, so it tends to go back into the field, which means you get to remove it again. So it's not great, but, you know, obviously the cost is not huge. This cost is about, you know, $50, maybe a little bit less, and so it's feasible to accomplish within a small, uh, you know, household or extended family level. Yeah? I'm sorry, what are the... Oh, that's concrete. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, they are actually uh, just concrete with, um, you know, a plug on the bottom and so on. Uh, to <coughs> so here's another one. And this one's a little better, but the same idea. Here's the, the water, this, this first well and, well, well but uh, cylinder. 
aeration here, flows down here, comes up here, then is filtered out, and then the water comes out. So about once a month, they should clean the filter. Yeah? And how, what's the percentage of arsenic that you can remove with this system? I'll tell you that in a minute. <laughs> um, you asked a good question. <laughs> uh, here's the arsenic. It, we looked at um, 20 exceeded, I guess there's 10 sites on this particular one, but it doesn't matter. It's typical. 1 to 232 micrograms per liter. So remember we were trying to get to 0 0.03, so it's still a lot. You know, that's uh, a number of orders of magnitude bigger. The average is 76. We'd like to get to 50. Iron, 5.4 to 24.4. The average was 11.6. So iron is critical for this to work. The orthophosphate, which is the fertilizer, that's 1.7 to 5.7 with an average of 3.7. pH, 6.6 .6 to 7.3, average of 6.8. And this is the oxidation reduction potential, which is a measure of the anaerobic versus aerobic characteristics. But it's negative, it is anaerobic, so that's why the arsenic is mobilized. So when they start to irrigate the field, they apply the phosphorus and they are then pumping groundwater over here for water, you're bringing the arsenic with it. <coughs> yeah? What about nitrates? Because yeah. they might be using the urea and the nitrates for fertilization. Yeah, nitrate does not interfere the same way. It can be highly relevant and don't have any slides on it, but nitrate's formation is a big issue, yeah. but it's a different issue. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it can certainly be real. Uh, this is the one that causes the most heartburn. Well, aside from the fact that there's arsenic there, I mean, but it, it's the one that interferes with it. So, in answer to your question, this is arsenic removal efficiency, zero to 100 percent. This is the iron, and you can see then, for the number that are at least displayed here, uh, getting generally in excess of 80 percent. They all achieve 50, milligram, sorry, 50 micrograms per liter in the effluent. 17 achieved 10 micrograms per liter. The removal varied between 60 and 96%, so this is 60 and highest there. The average is 87%, plus or minus, etc. So it does work, okay? Doesn't cost anything other than labor. They do have to clean the darn things periodically, and that's, you never know whether you're getting the answer to the question that they think you want to hear the answer to or <laughs> whatever, but we were around periodically a number of times to try to figure that out, etc. But anyway, this technology then does work. Now this is all at the village level. So this is a village of about 1,500 people. This is the water pump and they're drawing the water obviously from the ground. They're introducing the water here and then this thing, which we'll see in the next couple of pictures, it will step back a little bit, but you can see this is now a much bigger facility. So this handles then the village level, not the household level. Obviously more expensive. This little guy here is chlorination. So if they can afford it, what this little guy is doing is they have chlorine in here, and then this is a drip tap. They drip in accord with how many, you know, how much the consumption is, and so on. And this is just taking a step backwards. Um, take a look at these three guys here. We'll see them again in the next slide, but these three are the aeration system. So the water comes in um, right here. You can see the nozzle, so it's a hand pump. Um, comes in here, flows through these, much like that, that little long tube that had you know, the holes in it. This brings the water in, aerates it, this is the residency time now for the water to reach equilibrium, have the settlement uh, start to coalesce, etc. And then ultimately uh, the filter is in here and they, they have an upward flow system and then um, the water is cleaned. When they backwash, and what that means is you're sending water the wrong way, but the idea is to put it in quickly, jiggle the daylights as much as you can, jiggle the the uh, filter material and knock those sediments off. Then these little guys are the means by which they then drain that water because you do not want to drink that water. That's concentrated at all. So these guys then 
allow them to drain the water out from the bottom and then it simply discharges wherever and that's that's one of the students right now is just starting to work on trying to figure a way to better handle it than let it go back in the environment another issue but we'll leave it at that so here's more specifically what it looks like here's the pump handle and so on here's that uh, lattice work for the aeration and then here's the water down here so as they need it they pump the water and so on. This is now remember this is the village level so this is what they use to notify people should use the water or you should not so somebody is in the village is responsible for the green side go the other side is red meaning don't use it at that time it's the way of signaling to the people this is then the clean water that comes out and then you know people are down there washing etc so it works quite well same kind of removal efficiency that I referred to a little bigger uh, scale this is actually a JICA uh, Japanese International Cooperation something anyway Japanese uh, system okay so um, the severe challenge to get the types of concentrations desired. In other words, we're trying to get 50. We'd like to get a whole lot less, but you can't do it. One possibility is to combine several water supply sources like rainwater harvesting and groundwater to even out the risk. So in other words, one of the students also looked at then, gee, if I manage to collect the rainwater and I store it, I can avoid drinking the groundwater for a longer and longer period of time. And if, obviously, if I'm very wealthy, I could afford many cisterns and therefore have water without the arsenic exposure for a longer period of time. So this is the maximum allowable arsenic concentration in groundwater for different cistern sizes for a body burden of arsenic equivalent to 0.05. So in other words, here's the cistern size, 0.5 cubic meters, one, two, so on. This is the number of days that you could use the water. This, what the student did was run a rainfall model with a you know, a roof, catch the water up to the vessel size, like clearly if there's more water than half a cubic meter, you, it's lost. But if you can't afford more than this, you know, you can make this number become larger by having a bigger cistern. But of course it costs more money. So you could, if you have a cistern of 0.5 cubic meters, you could get water on average to last 127 days. In other words, this is taking the amount of water that's used for, you know, by a family. I think we picked five people in the family and so on. If you can afford a bigger cistern, like a 2.5 cubic meters, then you could last 155 days. That's on average. Some days, some years are obviously wet and some years are not, but anyway, it doesn't matter. This is an average to look at the kind of opportunities that do exist. If you were then using this cistern, you could drink 0 0.077 milligrams per liter of arsenic in the water and end up with the same body burden as 0 0.05 when you drink it for the entire year. So in other words, this, this year, if you drank the rainwater for 127 days and you drank the groundwater for 365 minus 127, you would get the same level. You could have the concentration of arsenic up at this high. So this is a way perhaps of dealing with levels that are um, feasible at a higher level where they cannot afford the, the cisterns. That's, sorry, where they cannot afford the uh, iron removal plants. Anyway, that's one option. So that looks interesting. Cisterns aren't too hard to come by. Um, obviously cost more. but. What's going to happen with climate change? Is it going to get less or is it going to get greater? This is what the July precipitation looks like projected into the future. And I've taken some liberties here, but what actually happens is we looked over here at the historical record and this is using climate change models. So we ran the global climate change models or GCMs into the future up to the year 2100. This is the precipitation in July that's expected as we move forward. And as I say, if you looked at the historical record, which isn't on this figure, it would be basically a continuation. What it says is in July, they're gonna get more rainfall. Good stuff. Obviously there's a variability, you expect that. So July looks good, but that's their wet season. If you look at October, 
same period of time on the lower axis, they're actually going to get less precipitation. So as we move forward, net-wise, they get more rainfall, but they are going to get wetter when it's already wet, and when it's dry, it's going to be drier. This is not good news. So if you look actually at the months, this is January, February, and so on, up to December. This is the projected temperature change for individual months in degrees Celsius. So you can see that typically one to two degrees. This is in the year 2100, but it, you know, it's going to go from an average whatever to, uh, well, I don't know, between 1.7 and 2.5 degrees hotter. Here's the precipitation in 2000 by month. Here's the precipitation projected in the year 2100. So it's going to go from 118 down to 98 in January. It's going to go from 93 down to 89 and so on, assuming the models are right. This is the one that was July. 431 is going to go to 542 and it will be, in other words, 26% higher rainfall. So climate change is not actually favorable to them. It's going to be hotter. The evapotranspiration will be higher. Precipitation will be about the same, but unfortunately it's going to be drier when it's dry and it's going to be wetter when it's wet. So not, not good. So what they're looking at is ways of perhaps going back to surface water treatment. So this is a, uh, obviously a local surface water body. This is, remember, back in 1970, what everybody used. So what JICA has built is this thing, which is basically a water treatment system. Now, this is for a big village. This is not, obviously, you can see it's relatively complicated. It's the same principle that we have referred to earlier, but now on a much more substantial village size. I won't go into all the details, but the principles are the same. That thing that we were just looking at is right here. <coughs> This thing is a tower. And what they do then is they pump the water that's treated here up to this level here. And why are they doing that? Well, now what they can do, and this is why Jike is doing it, is they're gonna put it into a limited distribution system, but it, it is a, a few pipes that go out laterally from this tower with a pressure now that can deliver the water one or two kilometers. It's not, you know, we're not talking miles and miles, but distances. So if you go away from this thing in different directions, well, sorry, this is the chlorination just before we get there, but this, this water is being chlorinated in the same manner, so here's a, a drip system adding to it. But here now is about a kilometer away a village uh, water tap. So now what you have is watering points a long way, well, relatively long way away from the water source. If you have to wa walk six, eight times a day to pick up water, the ability to collect it at your household is a whole lot nicer. And I don't mean individual household, this is for a grouping of buildings in this vicinity. This was not a local resident, he was a... Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway the, uh, the whole idea at least is now they're providing water so that people don't have to walk as far. So that's a real plus. So JICA, as you can see, is a fairly big player. So that's really about it. What we've got is a big problem. Don't have much money. We have an arsenic problem, which we know causes cancer. We would love to get it down to the levels that we use, but that's not realistic at this point in time. Risk assessment may be a response to the trade-offs. So that's why I'm saying if you can get collective areas and have cisterns where you collect the water and you know, put it into a cistern, etc., and have that water used when it's available and then when it's exhausted, then you have to go back to the groundwater. But clearly, if you can get the groundwater improved, as long as the iron's reasonably high, then you'll get uh, you know, at least levels that are much, much better. Uh, still 1,600 times higher than we'd like, but better. Arsenic removal to meet the guidelines is extremely difficult. The technologies for available funding don't really exist. So even the ones that I referred to at the village level, they're being subsidized to be able to build them. 
very difficult for them. I mean, that's thousands of dollars to, to uh, build a sophisticated system, even like the one that I said. It's not a, an energy problem. It's simply a concrete, uh, pouring, and so on, all of that associated with it. So um, big problem, very widespread. It's not like you can simply say, well, we don't like that water. We'll use the water from you know, 100 meters away. It's going to be equally bad. And unfortunately, you can find some wells, like I was there and I, I didn't bring a picture of it, but what they do is if the well is contaminated, it's to be painted red. That's, yeah, and if it's clean, they paint it blue. So I was in one village and I looked at this well and I said, oh, this is blue, good. This is good quality water. There was a noticeable silence. So, okay, uh, something's up here. So I said, uh, is there a reason this is not acceptable quality water? And they said, well, all the red paint washed off. <laughs> mm. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, what it is, is there, if you are having your family drinking from a contaminated well, your children are not as desirable for marriage. So rather than be upfront that they're drinking poor quality water, they change the perception. So the reality is there's a whole lot of technology transfer to make sure that people behave the way that they should. I mean, I can understand what they're doing, but obviously don't agree because as a technical person, you shouldn't drink that water. But if that's all the water you've got, that's what you drink. So I found a lot of that. Some of the students have been extremely good at technology transfer. I didn't bring the slides, but quite a bit of the work. How am I doing in terms of time? Okay, I guess I better stop soon anyway. Um, you know, to clay pot filters are a pretty good example of a technology that's pretty good for waterborne pathogens. And by that I mean, think of a flower pot without a hole in the bottom. The idea then is you get a filtration uh, effect as the water moves through the clay. Well, you, you add clay and rice husk and sort of other things. The, the rice husk gives a porosity which allows the water to transfer through at the rate of about one to two liters per hour. Therefore, it becomes useful to a, a dwelling or to a household. Um, but you have to clean that thing properly and you have to do it religiously to ensure that the quality of the, the water is maintained. What happens is the biofilm builds up on there, but you can't let it clog or it becomes useless. But what people were doing was picking up the clay pot and putting it on the ground to clean it because it was much easier. The darn things are heavy. So they're cleaning it on the ground, but then of course it's lying on the ground, which means they're getting contamination on the outside where the good quality water is supposed to be. So there's a lot of training involved. I can, as a technical person, come up with some ideas, but if people don't follow them, I'm wasting my time. So fortunately, some of the students have been extremely good at trying the technology transfer. So arsenic removal to meet the guidelines is extremely difficult. We have a big problem. Climate change is going to make things more challenging. So, you know, climate change does not look like it will help us, it will hurt us. And then there is the fluoride problem, which is very pervasive also. Fluoride's a totally different animal and extremely difficult to remove. And I think that's it, yeah. Anyway. I guess if we have time for questions or whatever, yeah, absolutely. be happy to. So, are you okay fielding them? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. If I can't answer them, well, I'm not. <laughs> don't send them to me. I don't know either. Yeah. So, I'm just wondering, for like, storing the rainwater use, um, like, what's the chance of like, pathogens being in that water? Like, is it safe? Do they chlorinate it? Like mm -hmm. Very good question. Generally, no, they don't chlorinate it because they hate the taste. And if they use the same vessel to remove the water as they use for other purposes, you, again, that's a, a training issue. So fortunately, the pH, most of them are concrete. So the pH gets really high. That basically kills most of the pathogens. So in some ways, you're OK. But you know, depends on. Is boiling the water an option? It's possible, but can they afford it? So a lot of people do boil the water. Um, but the kids complain they don't like the hot water. They want cold water. So, yes and no. Yeah. So, it isn't easy. <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, I'm I'm not pessimistic. I just we just have to continue to work at it. What we're looking at is different technologies that will.
be more of a biocide, etc. Uh, you know, to treat the water without in a in a passive way. I mean, one way is to add silver, but silver, of course, costs money and it tends to get stolen, so that doesn't work so well. So you know, you but that's the kind of thing that we're looking at is how do you design a pot or whatever technology to get better water and uh, you know make things better. When I, oh, sorry, <laughs> when I first went to Cambodia, I said to the NGO that was selling these clay pots as a filter, I said, how did you design them? I said, oh, they work. I thought, okay, that's not quite what I asked, but so I'll ask it again. How did you design this thing to, you know, to, to get the dimensions and the porosity and so on? Well, it works. Okay, we're not getting an answer to this question, are we? <laughs> anyway. Um, what they don't necessarily understand the fundamentals. I think that's what we can bring mostly is the ability to understand, you know, if we change the redox characteristic or if we add silver nitrate or something, we can perhaps provide a better quality water. So that's what the students are trying to do. Sir. Yeah. Earlier in your presentation you mentioned going back to treating the surface water or yeah, to surface water. Yeah. Well in terms of cost effectiveness you, you did address it later, but uh, is that less is it not reasonable to do? Yes, you, oh yes, you can. There's a real resistance of the people because they look at the groundwater and see it's clear and they look at the surface water and say, that, that's <laughs> ugly. I mean, it doesn't look clear. Okay, so, so there's a physical resistance to it. Um, but you've got to make sure that your surface water treatment, well, first of all, do you have a water body like that? Not everybody does because, you know, it, it's a very wet country, but not everybody has access to the water. So where you can do it, sure. That's the best way. Avoid the arsenic because you know it's not such a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, just a few observations based on the work that we did in the late nineties and then continued on for a number of years. First, uh, just to uh, have a strong endorsement for for the point that you just made. Uh, we did quite a lot of work with the NGOs. And mm -hmm. They say quite unequivocally that they don't want to go back to drinking pond water. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's the perception, but I think there's also the reality that uh, they're afraid of cholera and diarrhea and all those kinds yeah. of problems which are much more immediate mm -hmm. compared to uh, you know, arsenicosis which shows up in five or ten years yeah. of uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. But the, the couple of observations I had, uh, we had also installed some household level treatment units. Okay. And we found that they were like these or at all? Or? They, they were uh, addition of uh, iron in small packets of chemicals. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then filtering through sand. Yep. And we found that there was over 95% removal of arsenic and mm -hmm. below 10 uh, micrograms per liter. So very efficient. Yep. In about a month, we found out that they were actually introducing a lot of pathogens. So we had to then modify and add other chemicals. So I, I think mm -hmm. the issue is that if you're just giving them part of the solution and not training them on, on mm -hmm. hygiene and other health aspects, yeah. you, you still end up with a negative outcome. Yeah. No, very good point. Um, I should have probably mentioned this, but they don't like iron either because it tastes, they can taste it, they don't like the taste. And also, it discolors the rice. It no longer looks so white, it now looks kind of browner, and so they don't like it. Yeah. So actually, they love this system, the iron removal plants, because it lowers the iron. It happens to remove a lot of the arsenic, which is really the reason we're there. But, but yes, perception and, and how the people behave is... Well, the, the other point is we did a study together with the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology and analyzed a whole lot of crops and food varieties, tomatoes, rice, Mm -hmm. And what we found was that because 80% of the water which is pumped out the, the groundwater is actually used for irrigation. Mm -hmm. And we were, again, concerned that there's uptake through food. And we actually found that there's accumulation in the stalks of the, yeah. of the rice, but there's actually nothing in, yeah. I mean, no appreciable amount in, in rice or tomatoes or potatoes, and I think there was a whole range of mm -hmm. yeah. So the direct consumption through food crops it's minimal, but then you're using contaminated water for cooking those. So mm -hmm. that's the food yeah. route uh, as opposed to just coming out through the crops. Yes. I mean, there is some uptake by the crops, and I can't remember the numbers well enough, but it's not tr 
not as big as the water by any means, but it isn't zero either. No, no it's yeah. not zero, yeah. but it's yeah. trivial in terms of the consumption and uptake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it does depend, of course, on the crop you're producing, but uh, but yeah. I think there was a. I had a question just about what the level of knowledge in terms of the population. How do they understand that there is something in the water that's causing chronic illness? Or I don't know whether I can actually comment. I, I think so, but of course I can't communicate with them directly. Um, you know, I, I was in the village, for example. I took those pictures in the of the water tower, etc. And the people were quite keen on showing me their arsenicosis. Yeah, sure so, um, well, in that village, certainly. The problem is, of course, there's a whole bunch of villages, so I don't know. Um, yeah, whether they think it's from something else. Yeah, and I mean, this, that was only, well, that was actually in Jasora. But anyway, relatively close to Dhaka, they're reasonably aware. But as you go further and further afield, I'm not sure. How do you detect it? Yeah, how do you detect it? Oh, we so measure it, but I mean, there are... Well, how, do you, how do you measure it, if you don't mind? Oh, there's a handheld meter, which is a pretty good indicator, and then obviously also you bring it back to the laboratory. The question was, how do you detect the arsenic levels? We did it both in the field, but also in the laboratory. So it's a, you know, it's not trivial, but it's, the handheld meters aren't bad. Okay. They're a pretty good indicator. Um, so. uh, my question is in line for this question, and I'm just wondering in terms of, uh, so there is awareness that there's that problem, but in terms of the community's agency, are they seeking solutions, and how um, how much agency do they have in decision making when it comes to the solutions that you're providing or trying to come up with? Uh, again, I'm going to have to do it on my, my knowledge, which is really limited, but the NGOs are out there working. We worked with a particular one, uh, Ryan Brennan. He worked for four months with one NGO. They have about 500 of these items, you know, facilities. They managed to get funding from other sources for about 80% of the cost. The people are required to pay some of it. And the part of the rationale for that is if they pay for it, in, at least in part, they feel they own it more than like the clay pots would be an example. At first when they went to Cambodia, there are three large groups that distribute these clay pots. And they gave them away. Well, people wanted the next one for the same price. Um, they can't afford to do that. You've got to make them you know, pay a little bit, uh, commensurate with what they can afford, so that they have value for it. Now, the problem, you're quite right, is if they don't uh, perceive there's any improvement, um, then they may not continue to use it. That's always an issue. You know, are they telling us what, <laughs> what they think we want to hear or not? So basically when, if it's a pathogen, they tend to get sick relatively frequently and they can say, well, our children are off, better off than the one down the street that doesn't have one of you. That's, that's easier, kind of getting to what you were saying. When it's arsenic and it shows up in 5 or 10 or 15 years, that's harder. But if you get rid of the iron and you convince them of that, then they'll, they'll think there's a real value to it. So a little bit of both, but, and I'm, you know, I'm clearly just a technical guy. I'm not into technology transfer other than whatever I can make sense of, but um, there's a lot of people out there that are a lot better at it than me. So the NGO was the individual, and he has, I don't know, 30 or 40 people that are working in the Manikanj district. It's about an hour's drive north of, da of Dhaka. That's where, they're, where his particular group is working, and he just raises funds from wherever he can obtain them. So whether it's by word of mouth or observation or whatever, now the people that, um, if you remember the lady that was standing beside one of them, they are absolutely delighted with it. So they tell somebody and, and you know, on it goes. That's probably the best way. But, okay. Yeah. Who support this program? Do you see that? For this? Uh, Canada Research Chairs Program. 
yeah, I, I am a research chair. I get certain amounts of funds. I can do things with it that nobody, well, they care, but they don't tell me that I've got to do X. Um, Ryan Brennan, Kim Thomas, Laura Robertson, and so on, those were all NSERC scholars, so it actually didn't cost me very much. So they were paid themselves. What I paid was their transport costs to get there and you know, laboratory, et cetera, while they were there. It's a problem. Are they collaborating with universities? Are oh yeah, Bouet is very important in this. They, they were the, they were the laboratory that we relied on, yeah. because they are accredited lab. But you know, there's no problem finding NGOs that are pretty keen on working with you. The problem is, of course, us cost money and so on. No. One more thing, did you find arsenic concentration in the or in the coastal area more? We were not working in the coastal area. We were working all around Jasora, which I don't have a map, but it's about an hour flight from Dhaka. That was where we worked, and then in the Dhaka area. Jasora is, I'm not sure, about the third or fourth biggest city, reasonably sizable, but not you know, in the vicinity of those. So we could drive easily to an hour north to uh, Manikinj, which is a district area. But the coastal area, that's a whole new ball game because they got salinity problems that are just scary. And you know, once you get salinity, like if it's a heavy storm or whatever, and it brings the darn salt in, how do you get the salt out? I mean, that, the salt vulnerability is as important as the arsenic problem there. Yeah. And uh, what type of other environmental problems in uh, Bangladesh they have? They need more? <laughs> No, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, I, actually, it's a good question you raise. One of the biggest challenges that I'm worried about, India is going to divert water down to Calcutta from the Ganges using uh, the Faraka Barrage. Yeah. And China's looking towards moving the water from the Brahmaputra to the north because they're short of water. Here's old uh, Bangladesh. Um, the average elevation of Bangladesh is nine and a half meters. It's the flattest country I've ever been in. I mean, it'd be great to ride a bicycle because there's no such thing as a hill. <laughs> but it's very, very difficult. So, like, it's very flat. They tend to live on the slight mounds that exist there because it's a little better. Yeah. But they've developed rice that grows, you know, with the water levels because that's what happens. It floods so much. Now, of course, India isn't going to take the water during the wet season. No, it'll take some water, but it won't matter. It's the dry season that's the problem. So, I expect that the groundwater levels will drop precipitously if they start to increase as they are planning the water diversion down to Calcutta or Kolkata. Brambaputra is a little further away, uh, uh, sorry, in time, not distance. But the Faraka barrage already exists. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Bangladesh is objecting that one, I know that one. Yeah. Because Western India wants to bring the water from the Ganges to the, up to Kanyakumari. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know the interconnection yeah. there was it. There's also dams being built on every tributary coming into Bangladesh. Yeah. They want the water. I mean, uh, this is going far beyond what we're talking about here, but you know, if you look at the Mekong, the Chinese are using more and more water, and the Cambodians on the down gradients or downstream side are saying, where the hell did all the water go? And if you go, I mean, look at uh, the U.S. with the Colorado River. By the time it gets to uh, Mexico, you can walk across it. What happens if they build the more dams in the Streams, you know, and you are not getting enough water to bring because salt water intrusion comes in. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so yeah. If it doesn't keep the salinity out. Yeah. But then look at Turkey. They're building 13 major dams. Here's Iraq, which contributes nothing to the Tigris and Euphrates. But here's Turkey building all these dams to use the water there, which means there's going to be less water. Which hmm. you know. Same thing I found it. Because in Krishna River, you know that Krishna River? I actually don't they, know that one. You know, but they yeah. built more dams there with water, mm -hmm. and there is no mass balance pushing the water, yeah. salt water. Okay. Already salt water included up to with coastal area 50 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like She's coming out with a hook. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I can stay around, I mean, but... Uh, yes. No, no, it doesn't matter to me, but... I know that you alluded to it, but I don't know if there's a final answer. Um, what's being done with the iron arsenic precipitate, and does that run a risk, like after it's been filtered out, and does it run a risk of being used for other things, like for example, the Indian Ocean Act, or any other Well, yes and no. Of course, the magnitudes are not so huge. 
but if you remember those little taps that I showed down at the bottom of the tank, it simply drains out of there into wherever it goes. Sorry, where is wherever it goes? <laughs> it's, it's called, uh, holy cow, it went away. Um, but that's, as I say, one of the students that's just starting this fall, um, well, just started, I guess, uh, she's going to try to look at that. What I'm interested in is, is there's something we can use. You cannot capture all the water because it's a reasonable amount of water. But if you could filter that and keep the darn arsenic in there, you know, by some chemical means, maybe that would be a mechanism to then, you know, as needed, like once every three months or whatever, pick up this box which has the, all of this arsenic in it and take it somewhere. That would at least be preference. But it's not a marvelous solution, it's simply better. Right now it goes wherever it goes. So I did ask the question, where does that go? Oh, so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you can't really blame them because they got no option, but um, it doesn't make it acceptable. I'm going to call Cheers Prerogative and close the official part of the meeting. As was mentioned, Ed will be here, and so you're welcome to chat with him.